If you would like to appear on an episode of My Story Living with Lupus, you can contact us at mystorylivingwithlupus at gmail.com. Also visit us on our Instagram page and also our website, My Story Living with Lupus. The views and opinions expressed on my story, Living with Lupus podcast, represents each person's individual experience. By listening to this podcast or reading our blog, you agree not to use this podcast or blog as medical advice to treat any medical condition in either yourself or others. As always, consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. My Story Living with Lucas podcast is officially trademarked, all rights reserved. Thank you for joining me for another episode of My Story, Living with Lupus Podcast. I'm your host, Susan Hendricks, and I'm so glad that you could join me on this Friday, November 13th, 2020. Hey, have you ever been told, but you don't look sick? Hmm. Well, I know I have. What about you? Well, today's episode is all about how broad categories like autoimmune impact patients' experience. Now, you know what I want you to do. All the way from the United States to Bay of Plenty, Wellington, Auckland, Southland, New Zealand. Go grab your cup of coffee, your cup of tea, and to my listeners, late at night, grab your favorite glass of wine and come on and join the conversation right here on My Story, Living with Lupus Podcast. Thank you for tuning in. But you don't look sick. How broad categories like autoimmune impact patients' experience. When your disease is hard to name and doesn't have visible symptoms, it can be hard for others to understand that you are sick. Now, patients with autoimmune diseases often have an illness experience riddled with symptom ambiguities and shifting diagnosis. You know, a new study found that one way patients and physicians can work through the difficulty and frustration of communicating about these conditions is to use both broad diagnostic terms like autoimmune disease as well as narrow ones such as MS or lupus. Now, When your disease is hard to name and doesn't have visible symptoms, it can be hard for others to understand that you are sick. And when people don't know much about your disease, it can be hard to explain it to family and friends. This sentiment is particularly true for the some 50 million 
people in the United States living with autoimmune diseases like lupus or MS, where the condition is chronic, but achieving a specific diagnosis may take time. The diagnosis may change. Symptoms may not be overtly apparent. And in many cases, both a cause and a cure are unknown. How many remember going to the doctor to try to find out what is wrong with you? They can run a litany of tests before they can really pinpoint exactly what is the cause of you feeling like you feel. Now, have you heard the saying, the practice of medicine? That's right. It is a practice because they are trying to rule out every other um, illness and condition there is. Doctors are practicing medicine. No one doctor can go in and say right off the bat, this is what you have for sure without running tests. And the tests will give the definitive diagnosis or rule out a diagnosis. But when it comes to patients with autoimmune diseases, often have an illness experience riddled with symptom ambiguities and shifting diagnosis. A new Drexel University study found that one-way patients and physicians can work through the difficulty and frustrations of communicating about these conditions is to use both broad diagnostic terms like autoimmune disease as well as narrow ones such as lupus or MS. Kelly Joyce, PhD, a professor in Drexel's College of Arts and Sciences and a member of the Center for Science, Technology, and Society, studies the cultural dimensions of medicine. Her research investigates the experiences of people diagnosed with autoimmune illnesses. In analyzing how people live with autoimmune illnesses, Joyce and former Drexel graduate student Melanie Jessick found that the use of a broad category like autoimmune provides con- continuity, certainty, and even community for patients who struggle to convey their often inconsistent illness experiences with clinicians, family, and friends. Now, drawing on 45 in-depth interviews with people who live with autoimmune illnesses, Joyce's research showed that both broad diagnostic classifications and narrow diagnostic classifications are integral to diagnostic work and illness experiences. Talking about illnesses, researchers found that participants, regardless of gender, 
age or specific disease diagnosis tended to use the broad category autoimmune in addition to a specific diagnosis like celiac disease or rheumatoid arthritis to talk about their health. Some of the reasons they used the terminology were to describe what's happening in their bodies and to make it easier to provide continuity even when there was a change in their specific diagnosis. Although friends and family may not understand the precise mechanisms of lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, for example, they could understand the general autoimmune process in which the body's immune system attacks healthy tissues and cells, Joyce stated. Now, the broad term also simplified the process of talking about the disease to friends and family, even as the specific diagnosis might change over time. When we return, we'll go further into You Don't Look Sick. We all know the benefits of apple cider vinegar. Now, you guys know that I'm a vegan and that I have lupus along with other health issues. I used to take ACV every morning before I worked out, but eventually the taste of ACV got to me and I had to look for another alternative and that's when a friend of mine turned me on to Goli. Goli is the first apple cider vinegar gummy. They give you all the benefits of ACV without the taste. That's right. Goli is vegan, gelatin-free, gluten-free, and 100% organic. And the vitamins and the ACV in Goli promotes a healthy heart by maintaining a healthy cholesterol range, controls blood sugar levels, and also curbs your appetite. And the best part about Goli, for every sale generated, a child in need receives a six-month supply of essential vitamins with vitamin angels. So if you don't believe what I'm saying, I'm going to give you some information so you can try Goli for yourself. Here's a promo code you can use. It's Sue Lin One. That's S U E L Y N N E One. And you'll receive 5% off of your initial purchase. Also, I'll leave a link. In the description in the podcast. So, why don't you go and try it for yourself? You won't believe how good it tastes. That's Goli. Thank you for joining me back. Now, let's continue the conversation. But you don't look sick. Now, 
The use of the category autoimmune meant participants did not have to put their lives on hold, even as aspects of their specific diagnosis change from ulcerative colitis to Crohn's disease, from lupus to mixed connective tissue disease, from one type of MS or lupus to another type of MS or lupus, and from having MS to not having MS to having MS. Autoimmune. Although an umbrella or broad category is productive for those experiencing illness, lending legitimacy to the symptoms that a person will experience. It can also help to distinguish a person's affliction from others that are more stigmatized. One specific example of this was that participants who live with type 1 diabetes, which is an autoimmune disease, who use the broad terminology to distinguish their illness from type 2 diabetes, a chronic condition caused by the body's inability to metabolize sugar as a way avoiding the stigma and blamed often associated with the latter. Now, when it comes to community, because people can experience the same autoimmune disease differently, participants noted that using autoimmune allows them to see similarities between themselves and others, creating a sense of community and shared experience. Many participants in our studies stress that heterogeneity of autoimmune illness, often saying things like, my MS is not like her MS, or no two people are alike. While most participants knew others who shared their specific diagnosis, it did not mean that their experience of symptoms their triggers for symptoms or their responses to a particular treatment were similar. Now, we all believe in raising awareness. Research has shown that people who are ill can benefit from social support when their disease is widely recognize. For example, there is often an outpouring of support during the various cancer and disease awareness months and efforts, both broadly in society and at an individual level. This unifying support can be difficult for illnesses like autoimmune diseases that is not as well understood in society. Now, the researchers suggest that recognizing that autoimmune can be a range of diseases and disorders similar to the way we think about the autism spectrum could aid our collective understanding of these diseases and support for those who are suffering from it. Now, you may be asking why broad categories are important. And I'll tell you this, 
more than 80 illnesses are considered to be autoimmune or autoimmune related. Though the illnesses under the umbrella vary widely, the common thread is an immune response that attacks healthy cells, tissues, and or organs. The study suggests that the label autoimmune provides at a minimum some understanding and a scientific explanation as to what is happening to patients, though an exact diagnosis may be a moving target. While this research focuses specifically on autoimmune illnesses, it does signal that broad and narrow categories may be important to medicine more generally. Within medicine, clinicians and researchers use the language of lumping and splitting to distinguish between two valuable diagnostic classification practices. The process of lumping creates broad categories and emphasizes connections. In contrast, splitting emphasizes the differences between illnesses, creating categories that tend to be narrow and more specialized, prioritizing differences rather than similarity. Sociologists study how clinical encounters and medical practice are social practices, that is, practice the practices that imbued with values, beliefs, and institutional and policy incentives. Yet many sociologists who study diagnostic practices have yet to acknowledge the importance of broad categories in diagnostic work. They focus on how clinicians and patients use narrow diagnostic labels, missing the importance of broad categories. Sociologists who study how people live with illnesses tend to focus on life after a specific diagnosis. So they have also paid little attention to the importance of broad categories in medical practices. Now that we know in light of the findings, Joyce suggests clinicians should consider presenting patients with both broad and narrow disease classifications when discussing autoimmune diagnosis intentionally and over time. The use of broad category may provide continuity and certainty in doctor-patient communications, even as narrow disease diagnoses change or when symptoms do not map neatly into diagnostic tests or markers. Now, some healthcare organizations are taking the lead and reorganizing the delivery of services in recognition of the changing diagnosis and, at times, unknowable dimensions of autoimmune illnesses. As an example, of this reorganization 
West Penn Hospital in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, excuse me, opened the first institute dedicated to autoimmune illnesses in February 2018. In the excitement over precision medicine, Joyce notes that study shows the importance of maintaining the use of broad categories in the experience and treatment of illness, as well as using narrow diagnostic labels. Now, do you believe that nurses with COVID should continue to work? That's our next discussion, so stay with me. Ophthalmology Associates, PC, Drs. Berman and Dr. Zuckerbrod, treating diseases of the eye and eye surgery. You can reach them at 313-341-3450. Do you think nurses who are asymptomatic with the virus should continue to work? Well, here's your daily roundup of news on the virus and the rest of medicine. With its healthcare system poised, To be pushed beyond its limits, North Dakota will allow nurses actively infected with SARS to keep working if they're asymptomatic. The U.S. hit a record number of coronavirus hospitalizations and surpassed 1 million new confirmed cases in the first 10 days of November as reported by the AP. As of 8 a.m. Eastern Time Wednesday, the John Hopkins unofficial U.S. tally stood at 10,260,282 cases with 239,000 695 deaths. That's up 149,730 cases and 1,444 deaths. If Pfizer submits its positive initial trial data, to health regulators as quickly as expected. Some Americans can start being vaccinated in December. HH Secretary Alex Azar stated via Reuters, but if and when the Pfizer vaccine is available, Many states may not be ready to deal with its unusual storage and transport requirements. Did you know that multi-layer cloth masks protect both wearers and those around them? Now, cell phone data from 98 million people predicted a small number of super spreader points. That's right. Restaurant, gyms, cafes, hotels, 
and religious established had a disproportionately large role in driving up the virus and infection rate. Patients told the New York Times that a Connecticut physician took advantage of the pandemic, charging insurance companies thousands for super COVID tests and $480 for a short phone call to relay test results. In other news, investigational significantly reduced the tax over placebos in a phase three trial of patients with severe asthma. Mental health professionals and crisis workers, not the New York Police Department, will respond to mental health emergencies in a pilot program in two high-need New York City neighborhoods. The CDC reported a new outbreak of E. coli in Six states possibly linked to romaine lettuce. Months after the pandemic started, medical practices struggled to stay open, with average revenue dropping by 32%, and one in five physicians reporting reductions of 50% or more. That's been your daily roundup provided to you by MedPage today. If you have any romaine lettuce in your refrigerator, either return it back to the store or discard it. And also, Double up on your mask. It is proven to help not only you, but others around you. Stay with me. Well, you know, it's that time for me, but... Before I go, I want to tell you on this past Sunday, November the 8th, 2020, the foundation I formed in honor of my parents, the Charlie E. and Minnie P. Hendricks Foundation went out into the community. We provided clothing to the homeless and Also, a total of 64 meals. That's right, we fed 64 people. And I would like to um, just say, if you would like to donate, we are in need of men's clothing and if you would like to donate you can contact me at susan at c e m p h foundation dot com we are in need of men's clothing we ran out Um, of men's clothing on Sunday. So we are in need of men's clothing and toiletry items. And if you would like to donate, we would appreciate it. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, so donations are tax deductible. Before I go, 
I would like to say this to you, that life is not measured by the number of breaths we take, but by the moments that take our breath away. The life you have left is a gift. Cherish it. Enjoy it now to the fullest. Do what matters now. I wish you a most peaceful, joyous, blessed, and oh so safe weekend. I'm Susan Hendricks, your host for my story, Living with Lupus Podcast. I'll see you next week for a conversation with Dr. Patricia Dar, rheumatologist. Have a great one. and opinions expressed on my story, Living with Lupus Podcast, represents each person's individual experience. By listening to this podcast or reading our blog, you agree not to use this podcast or blog as medical advice to treat any medical condition in either yourself or others. As always, consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. My Story Living with Lupus podcast is officially trademarked, all rights reserved. Thank you.